Welcome back to another edition of the Net Report Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Broadbent. Joining me once again is my co-host, Richie Schneiderite. Second podcast in a row, we have a very special guest. Uh, Rutgers legend Mike Teal is here to preview the season, go through some old war stories, and just kind of chop it up with us. So uh, appreciate you coming on, Mike. Thanks for having me, guys. Great to uh, great to see you again. It's crazy football season's right around the corner now. I know. It's, it's always bittersweet. We were talking about this off the pod, but... It always signals the end of summer, and uh, I'm a summer guy at heart, so bittersweet, but at least we have football season to look forward to. Uh, September is that sneaky month where it's still summer weather and you get football, so it's kind of the best of both worlds, but all downhill after that. Um, so, Mike, you've uh, you've kind of stayed close to the program since you've graduated. Um, obviously, you spent some time in the NFL, you spent some time coaching, but now you're uh, you're kind of straddling the the world of uh of sports and of profession so just tell uh, tell the listeners kind of what you're up to these days sure sure so yeah it's been uh i've been fortunate to be able to keep kind of football in my world um, i work as a wealth management professional uh we work with uh business owners corporate executives but i have a special niche um in the football war world of coaches and players um, so we help coaches and players, you know, figure out their financial goals and, you know, get them to, to where they ultimately want to go, um, you know, on the back end of, of their careers and, and retirement and stuff like that. You know, the simplest way to say it is I'm a financial advisor, but, you know, we do a lot more than that. Um, combine that with being able to do the radio for Rutgers football, um, working with coaches and players, it's kept me around the game, which is a game that I absolutely love and, and I've spent, you know, majority of my life in. So, uh, you know, to your point, it's kind of the best of both worlds right now for me so it's been it's been fun so, so what's the learning curve like fun. with uh announcing um you know the the first half of the first game was steep um i had never done it before um it was kind of a last minute fill in a couple of years ago when i first started doing it um chris carlin was awesome um and as you do it more, you start to feel a rhythm and you start to kind of feel when to interject, when to kind of let Chris go. And and the thing with us, we have three guys in a box. So it's Chris, Eric, Legrand, and myself. So a little more of a dynamic of, of when to talk, when not to talk, kind of let people go. So it, it's a real feel thing. And I think after that first half of that first game, we started to kind of get in a little bit of rhythm and, um, and we've been doing it since and we have a lot of fun with it. So hopefully the listeners uh, enjoy it because I know I enjoy it a lot. Oh, I'm glad you guys have a rhythm because I, I'm interrupting Mike already. Like, it's just, it's, it's a mess <laughs> well, over I was, here. I broke the cadence. So I, well, yeah, you go, I, I go. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I figured. But anyway, uh, just to clarify, you're doing it again this season, right? Uh, yes, I am. Okay, awesome. So I'm sure I'll see you there. I saw you, saw you at practice the other day, so let's just, let's just dive right into that. Um, what, what are your it. thoughts? What do you think? Is, is this a bowl game team? We, we don't have to get to that yet, but... Yeah, I mean, that's right how everyone wants to judge it early on. You know, are they going to be able to make a ball? I, I don't know. The thing that I saw from the second I walked down there, and, and unfortunately, I didn't get to any earlier practices. So it's like mm -hmm. midway through camp. Guys are kind of grinding right now. But the first thing you see is you see – guys that physically look different like they look like a college mm -hmm. football team right now they look like a big 10 team do they have you know six six 300 pounds across the board on the offensive line no but you look at all these positions i think predominantly in the skill position um you look at some of the receivers that they've brought in i know the transfer portal has helped but they mm -hmm. look like a big 10 college football team right now physically um you know does that translate to playing well on a field i don't know but i do know it gives you at least a chance and I don't know if we've had much of a chance, um, you know, in, in the past couple of years, uh, but I think we have a much better chance now uh, just based off how they've trained this offseason. So credit to Jay Butler and the strength staff for really changing those guys physically. Um, and then you add a couple of the, the new veteran coaches in, um, whether it's Sharaka or Brock or Flats um, on, the def on the offensive side. Uh, the defensive side, I think, did a great job last year. But, you know, you've got guys that, that have coached that are experienced, and I think you're going to put the players in the right position to have a chance to win. So you mentioned Soraka, the the new offensive coordinator. He was actually there your final year at Rutgers, not as the offensive coordinator, but as the receivers coach. So tell us a little bit about what your experience was being around Coach Soraka. 
Yeah, you know, it was it was definitely a different dynamic, right? Because he wasn't the coordinator. But um, I spent a lot of time with him and the receiver. So I, I don't know if it was Monday nights or Tuesday nights. I, I can't remember back to what day we met. But the receivers and myself would meet at 9 p.m. in the facility. So after the day was done, after everyone finished class, and we'd go back to the facility to watch film. I want to say it was probably Monday because the coaches were doing the game plan. And, and Kirk would always be in the building and he would always come down into the film room and watch film with us and talk about some of the new game plan tweaks and what they saw about the defense that we were playing that week. And you just listen to him dissect and talk about the defense that we were playing that week. And, and you could just tell he was an experienced veteran guy back then. That was shoot like almost 15 years ago. That's how, how old I'm getting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Goes but, quick, uh, man. It does. It really does. But he was he was a guy who understood it and got it and was able to um, to to convey and translate their thoughts to the players in the meeting room, which is extremely important because you could have the best ideas in the world. But if you don't know how to talk to the players and get it, you know, into not layman terms, but broken down of the reasons why and how, then it doesn't make a difference. You know how smart you are. He was able to do that. And, and I think that. For the quarterback room specifically, having a guy like that, being able to, to break things down for them is going to be extremely valuable. Now, how familiar are you with the other guys? I know you just mentioned Dave Brock, Coach Flats. Are you, are you familiar with them at all? Have you ever worked with them previously? or? Yeah, never worked with either of them. Um, I, I, know, I know Coach Flats um, from being in North Jersey. His son went to St. Joe's Montvale. Um, mm -hmm him working for the Giants. I, he, he lives in the same hometown that I grew up in. So back when I was, you know, around, around there a lot more, um, I would run into him at the bagel shop or the convenience store or the, you know, the food store. And we talk mm -hmm. all the time. So I, I developed a good relationship with him over time, never worked with him. Um, but I mean, his resume speaks for itself. You hear guys like Sean O'Hara or Chris mm -hmm. Snee or, you know, any of those guys talk about him. That that's enough, you know. I don't think you need to go any further, you know, with his resume. Um, Coach Brock, he came in after I was already gone. Um, I didn't get to be around the program as much back then because I was still playing, but I, I did get to spend some time with a bunch of players that he he coached, like the Mohammed Sanus of the world and mm -hmm. some of those receivers. And same thing, they have nothing but uh, extremely high praise for him, which I think again is important because you've got to, you know, for a, the most part, a young group in the skill rooms um, on the offensive side, and, and you've get and, and even not not even just skill, even on the offensive line, but you get some veteran coaches that are going to come in and uh, and coach these guys up and coach them hard uh, and get them better, which I think is something that we've been missing the last couple of years, uh, you know, in some of those position groups on offense. So, so piggybacking off that one real quick, you've you seen him in the bagel shop. It, does he just nonstop yell at the like, at the counter girl too? Because that's what it seems like in practice, like. No, no, he's he's a different guy off the field, no question okay. about that. Um, Fair enough. But listen, he's he's an intense SOB, very, so uh, very. <laughs> you know that that's it's that position though. It's his most intense position in sports. You know, between the offensive yeah. and defensive lines, they're they're going you know one on one every single play with the guy across from them, and it's just an intense physical position. Yeah. So, into some QB talk. Uh, Gavin Wimsat is the starting quarterback, was announced before camp. Um, he's got all the potential in the world. Everyone's seen it from, you know, the 50-some yard run at Boston College to just him, like, you know, throwing some absolute ropes when he needs to. But his accuracy has kind of been his biggest issue. Coming from a guy in yourself who improved his accuracy every single year in college, basically improved every single stat you had in college, is there anything that a quarterback can do to improve their accuracy and obviously you did it so it is possible so what were some things that helped you improve your accuracy in terms of uh just your progression as a quarterback sure i mean that's it's kind of a loaded question because there's so many things that go into the quarterback being successful um you know for me personally i think it was consistency in the system that i was in you know the more you understand your system and and uh, you really have a true feel for the entire field. I think you have a chance to get the ball into your guys' hands quicker, um, more efficiently, um, more accurately. All those things that you look for in a quarterback. You know, you kind of talked about some of the inconsistencies with Gavin. You know, right now he's been on campus for two or three years and he's had, you know, two coordinators now. 
Um, so yep. you're a young, you're a young player um, that isn't really exposed to, you know, systems like you are in college. You come in right, straight from high school, the learning curve is steep, and now you're learning a second system within, you know, a, a two year window. Um, I think for him, the most important thing is going to be just taking in as much information as possible and how much information can he take in and, and retain and then go out and execute. And that's, I think, going to be Shiraka's job and Coach Giano's job and, and the staff is to understand how much can we throw at this young kid, how much can he retain, and how fast can he go out and play. For me, I think that's how I was able to kind of improve year over year was that I was retaining more and more information and I was communicating that to the coaching staff who's John McNulty back then. Um, Kirk was the receiver coach, um, Craig Versteeg, all those guys, but I was, I was communicating it back to them. And then they were able to, to craft game plans based on, you know, what I was comfortable with, but also what was going to be successful that week versus the team we were playing. So open lines of communication between the quarterback and the offensive coordinator, I think is extremely important. And then consistency in, in, in how you call things. Gotcha. So now like on top of that accuracy wise, is it just repetition with drills? Is it like, cause like we've seen him be super accurate at times and then other times it just, just he'll sail a ball. There's, there's no secret about that, but. Um, yeah. I mean, some of it's fundamentals, you know, just mm -hmm. being consistent in, in your platform, in, in your stride, in your turn. Um, you know, everyone talks about throwing a football. It's funny because I was having this conversation with Anthony Cali um, at practice <laughs> last week. And everyone used to talk about that like, keeping your elbow up and flicking mm -hmm. the ball with your hand. And that that's nowhere near the right way to, to, to coach a kid on how to throw a football. Throwing a football is more like hitting a baseball or hitting a golf ball where you're turning your torso, you're turning your chest, you're turning your upper body, you're keeping your, as a righty, you're keeping your left your left shoulder, left of the target, turning to him and closing, and you're creating all this torque in your body. You know, so I see, you know, with a lot of really arm, talented arm quarterbacks, like Gavin's a really talented arm. He can throw the heck out of the ball. Sometimes these guys that are super talented try to rely on using their arm too much rather than using their technique and their, and their you know, their base and their body. And that's where he gets in trouble a little bit because he's so talented with his arm. He just tries to flick it out there rather than use his body. So I think just working on the fundamentals, that one will, will eliminate a couple of those um, off-target throws. But then as you get put into a, a situation where you're in the pocket and you're reading a defense and you're trying to get through progressions, it's again, goes back to that, how much can he retain? How mentally quick can he process it? Get the, get the decision in his mind and then his, get his body to align with making the throw. So I think as he learns the system more and as he gets more comfortable, he'll start to eliminate some of those kind of odd throws. Every once in a while, listen, you're gonna to try to make a throw with your arm and you'll be a little inaccurate. That's just physical, that's fine. Like you can fix that. I think for them, they're, they want to marry the mental part to the footwork and to the physical part. And the quicker they can do that, the better he's going to be. Yeah, and part of that, too, is the coaches getting to know him better. Because it's basically a, a whole new offensive staff and yeah. getting to know what plays he's most comfortable with, what he likes in certain situations. Uh, speaking of that, what was, like, your favorite play at Rutgers? Um, throw the ball to Kenny Britt. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> Throw it to your nah. first round receiver. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he made it a lot easier. Um, no, I, I, I really liked um, like the the deep like deep in cut with a shallow cross underneath it, where you're kind of high lowing one of the defenders. Um, we ran you know, a couple kind of different versions of high lows. We, we would play like a quarters team where we'd run like a ten yard in route or ten yard basic by number two, and then the outside number one receiver would run a post over the top. So it was like a safety high low post to to dig read or it was a dig to shallow read where you're kind of identifying one or two defenders um and, and i've talked about this a little bit this, in the past when i got to seattle and i played for greg knapp um r.i.p to him he was one of the best offensive minds i've ever met in my life um he really taught me how to identify defenders so like everyone talks about you know don't don't lock on the receiver and, and throw into coverage because you're looking at a receiver what he taught was you're never looking at a receiver you're looking at defenders because defenders tell you where to throw mm. the football um and, and i just found that so useful and helpful and i, and I wish i had to learn that a little bit earlier in my career uh, i think it would have been beneficial but getting your eyes on defenders and then high-lowing guys or moving guys with your eyes. Um, 
making easy throws based on on where the defender is and that's when i thought i, I started to have some success and i just wish i had to learn it a little bit earlier in my career yeah it's always nice when you can get some of that information in like the pre-snap read whether that be through motion or whatever you, you can do as a quarterback and uh maybe that's something as he kind of gets more comfortable in the offense he feels comfortable motioning guys in or out of the formation um but yeah sorry uh you can run with that. Yeah, it's up to yeah, you. Yeah, no, I'm, uh, I, I lost my place. So uh, all right, never mind. Um, so uh, it, 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 Rutgers is an easy place to play at. It's not an easy place to get recruited to. You obviously got recruited there. What What is your pitch? Like, if you were a coach right now for Rutgers, what would your pitch be to these high school kids right now? I, I think, you know, in a place like Rutgers, compared <clears> to some of these other places, you're, you're going to have, you know, an opportunity to come in, compete right away and, mm -hmm. and make a difference, right? You can go to – you know, some of the blue bloods in, in college football and, uh, you know, kind of sit on the depth chart for a couple of years. I mean, there's a quarterback going through it now at a school in, in the Big Ten where he's a local kid and, you know, he's kind of been waiting his turn. And now all of a sudden there there's a competition when he thought it was going to be, you know, his turn to be the guy. Um, mm. you know, you, you, sounds you like come... Kyle McCord. That's just my guess. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't say it. Yeah, um, you didn't say it. You know, but you, you come you come to Rutgers and you're going to have an opportunity to make an impact early. Um, mm -hmm. You're going to get a chance to put film together, um, you know, and, and it's twofold now. And I, and I hate even talking about this, but as a young kid, you know, all, everyone's talking about this NIL and all this other stuff. Well, in any level of football or, or sports, what's the best way to make money? You go on the field and you perform, right? Yeah. So if you're a young kid and, and you're talking about, you know, you might get, X amount from some team in the SEC or X amount from another team in the Big Ten. If you go out and you perform on the field, you're going to get paid. That, that's just yep. how it is nowadays in college sports. So, you know, it's almost like the reverse psychology of the NIL and, and yeah. how, how we have to recruit compared to some, you know, how some of these other guys recruit. Um, and then the other piece is you're, you're playing for a coach that has proven to put guys into the next level. So if your goal is to go play in the NFL, you know, the track record speaks for itself of, of development and then being prepared to go play at that next level. You look at the guys that I played with that, you know, had 10-year careers. That's, that's pretty damn hard to do in the NFL. And we had plenty of guys do that year after year. Yeah, I want to talk about that because that the rosters you played with were just absolutely loaded at Rutgers okay. from the receiver group in Tyquan Underwood and, and Kenny Britt. Clark Harris played in the league for 15 years as a long snapper. The defense is loaded between Courtney Green, the McCourty brothers, uh, you know, Eric Foster before he got hurt was, you know, making some noise in Indianapolis, George Johnson. I'm, I'm sure I'm missing guys. So I don't want to, I'm not, <laughs> I, I don't want to make it seem like I'm like, you know, Leonard, snubbing anybody, but Rice. what was it just like being around that many, you know, professional level players in college? Yeah, I think when we all got there, like there were a few exceptions, like the Kenny Brits, the Anthony Davises, like the Jeremy Zutas, those those were like four or five star type players. But if you look at, you know, Eric Foster, the McCordy twins, Taekwon, um, myself, even Leonard to to that degree, we weren't high ranked recruited players. So there was kind of a chip on on the team shoulder to to kind of prove that we belonged and, um, and and prove that we deserve to to be NFL caliber players. Um, you know, I thought the coaching staff did a great job developing everyone. But, you know, I was talking to coach last week down at practice and he was talking about the 06 team. And when you get a, a group of guys that that love each other and buy in, like every you hear every coach talk about this, you have to love each other, you have to play for each other, all this stuff. You know, you can say all that stuff, but when you turn the film on and you watch guys fly around, you know, 11 guys on defense run to the ball, you know, an offensive line finishing a run, pushing pushing the pile forward, that shows if, if a team really loves each other. And that 06 team that I was on, that's what you saw all over the film. So there was no mistaking, no doubt that that, that team had a love for each other, you know, like no team I was ever a part of. Um you know, I think that more so than anything, you know, outlasts the talent. The talent's great. You need the talent. But if you don't have that, you know, that that desire to be the best and, and push each other, you know, the talent only goes so far. And I think that's what was so special about those teams. I mean, since you already uh, kind of segued into my next question, um, but just tell us about that 2006 season. How crazy was that for you? 
what were the experiences like, not just the single game, but like the entire season, just going through it? Um, it, it was kind of in waves, right? Early on, you know, we had just won a couple games. Like it wasn't like anything crazy. If we beat Illinois, our defense didn't let them on the other side of the 50. We're like, all right, maybe we got pretty good defense. You know, uh, you know we yep. went down to North Carolina in the opener and beat them in, in a really hot, hostile environment. Um, you know, they had a Jersey quarterback that wanted to beat us and, and everything like that. So Is that Joe it, Daly? Yeah, Joe. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so we kind of we kind of got off to a good start early. And then, you know, as the year went on, the ball just kind of kept bouncing our way. That South Florida game on that Friday night, Jay McCourty breaks up the pass at the end of the game to kind of seal the victory. And, you know, you just start getting this momentum and you start to kind of get a feeling that it's just like supposed to happen. Right. And you combine that with working hard and, and putting confidence on a bunch of young kids, um, you know, it, giving young kids confidence to go out and say that, you know, we're supposed to win and we're supposed to be here. And then, you know, it just kind of trickles, 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 and all of a sudden explodes and, you know, kind of culminated uh, with the Louisville game, obviously, to, to get to 9-0. and And, you know, and then and then you kind of get a dose of reality the next week because you go out to Cincinnati, you know, everyone's telling us that, you know, we're the best. We're going to have a chance to play for a national championship. You know, Florida just lost. They were ranked two at the time. You know, we could slide in and then you go and get – literally your butt kicked by, by Cincinnati yeah. uh, in every phase of the game. Um, and it kind of brings you back to reality and, you know, then you kind of get going again and, and then you lose the triple, you know, triple overtime game. I have a chance to go to the orange bowl to West Virginia. And it's like, you know, what could we have done differently? It was so close to, to really being great. It was really good, but you know, to us, it wasn't great because we ended up in the Texas bowl. Yeah. And that kind of, it's, it's, it's unfortunate how, bad the Big East bull ties were at the time, because if that happens, you know, in the, the Big Ten now, you're playing on New Year's Day. You're playing in some game that everybody in the country is watching that game. Um, so it was a little bit of a bummer that, you know, a team that good had to just beat the hell out of Kansas State in the Texas Bowl, but it is what it is. Um, what was the night after the Louisville game like? Did you guys just like all go out as a team and just like rage all night? Or were you guys more subdued? How did you guys handle that? It was a blur. I, I do remember <laughs> that that coach gave us off on Friday night, which probably wasn't the, or gave us off for the weekend, which probably wasn't the best thing looking forward to the next week, having none, you know, know what the outcome eventually was going to be. Sure. Um, so that 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 Thursday night, like to your point, that Thursday night, there was nothing because I didn't get out of the, the parking lot with my family until three thirty, four a.m. So oh by the time God. I got home. You know, and there was no like party and like my my family, they like started the grill again and they had some food and stuff like that. But it wasn't anything crazy. Um, as I'm going through College Ave, like College Ave was still closed. I'm trying to get home just to go to sleep. The next day is is kind of when like it sunk in because it was on Sports Center, It was in the paper yep. and everything like that. And uh, I don't I don't remember exactly what we did. Um, three to, three I, day bender. Yeah, kind of. I, I wasn't I wasn't 21 at the time, so I couldn't do uh, like the bar uh, things. I, I would try, and they would kick me out. Um, man, so kick out. Oh damn. Yeah, man. yeah. It was it was rough. Um, it's wild. Yeah, I would go in. And never mind. I don't need to tell the story. Um, <laughs> so we probably did like the house party thing. Um, we had fun. Don't get me wrong. I know a couple of the older guys had fun until like Tuesday or Wednesday the following week. <laughs> um, which, which again, doesn't, doesn't help as you're getting ready to play a Cincinnati team on prime time Saturday night TV. Uh, but, but it, it was, it was an experience. It was like, I mean, there's, hasn't been anything like that. I don't know if there'll ever be anything like that. Just the, the momentum and, and the buzz and everything that went into that week and then that night. And then that weekend after it was just truly, truly incredible and special. Now, is that what you did for most post games, like uh, for home games at least? Uh, just go hang out with the fam afterwards? Yeah. So my family had like almost 50 season tickets when I played. So oh, wow. I, I wow. would get like 10 or 12 from like friends on the team and, and get like the players <laughs> tickets for like my immediate family. Mm -hmm. um, and then my family bought season tickets. They were in the, the upper deck on the on the home sideline like on the 40 or 35 yard line in the upper deck. So I knew exactly where they were and they were all up there for every game. So it was cool. Like for me staying home and playing at Rutgers and then my family getting to have a family reunion every week, you know, that we played at home. They, they did the yeah. huge tailgate. There was 60, 70 of them at a tailgate, you know, a couple of them stay in the parking lot, you know, most of them would go in. <laughs> 
Um, so I would get to go see them after the game and, and hang out for a little while and, and eat some food. And it, it was just really, really special to me to know that my family was there, knowing I was playing in front of my family. Um, but on the flip side there, it wasn't all great for me at times, right? I went through some adversity and, um, mm -hmm. and my cousins might've got kicked out of a couple of games because people were saying <laughs> some negative things about me and, you know, they weren't going to have it. Um, but, but it was pretty special to be able to do that. Uh, speaking of your family, did you just have a, a relative get drafted in the Major League Baseball draft, Kyle Teal? Unfortunately, we are Red Sox fans now, um, being, oh, being a Yankee fan my whole life. But I guess this year is a good year to transition because the Yankees stink. But yeah, my, my cousin. Okay. So there, there's two sides of my family. There's a Richfield Park and Little Ferry. They all go to Richfield Park High School. So the, okay. the Richfield Park side is my dad's side's cousin's. So my dad's cousin's son. So I, I don't even know how that works. I just say he's my cousin. Um, yeah, and, and then his dad's my <laughs> uncle. Yeah, they're, they're teal. So it's, it's family. Um, but yeah, Kyle played, played football and baseball at Mawa High School, went to UVA, was the ACC player of the year, was a consensus All-American. And I was just the first round pick for the Red Sox, which is pretty cool. Couldn't convince yeah, him to stay home? <laughs> Rutgers didn't recruit him. Really? Yeah, oh, not at that... the time. Speaks to baseball yeah. program. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's changed a little bit. Oh, I, yeah, you know, completely my, different. My idea. uncle and cousins are in the baseball business. They own a baseball facility, <clears throat> teams, and stuff like that. And, th and they've said that the baseball program down there has done a much better job in, in recruiting, you know, North Jersey guys as of recent. Oh yeah, it's completely. Yeah, Steve Owens is a stud. Um, uh, another great hire uh, for the. The, the Rutgers athletics program. Uh, he's yeah. done nothing but great things for the baseball team. The last three years, four years that he's been three, uh, three, four, three. Right? four, yeah. four, I think four, four. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's, it's tough to remember these things. Yeah, um, it goes fast. Yeah. <laughs> it does, man. But uh, go, shifting back to the team. So Rutgers hasn't had a ton of success at quarterback um, since Nova. And then previously you, um, any thoughts on uh, things that Rutgers can do better as far as quarterback recruiting and development? Um, consistency at the offensive coordinator position. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a stretch there after I left that, what was it? 10 years and 10 new coordinators yeah. or something like that. Like 11 and 12. <laughs> you're, you're in big time college football, right? Like yeah. that doesn't happen anywhere in the country. So yep. that's number one. You know, I don't care who's playing the position. If you don't have a, a consistent voice in that room that that's developing guys and, and inserting systems and, and teaching um, defenses and all this stuff, because you got to think about it. When a new coordinator comes in, the way you call a defense changes. You're not even talking about an offense. The, yeah. the way they call yeah. coverages, the way they see things. So you've got to relearn as, as a player. You have to relearn everything. So I can't even fathom like what Gary Nova went through where for five years straight, you're learning, <laughs> you know, new systems. It's ridiculous. It's almost yeah. embarrassing to be honest. Um, yeah. You know, so I think now finally having Kirk back and, and coach, I think that there'll be a little bit of consistency there. So that that's where it starts, right? Having consistency from there, identifying guys who you think fit what you're trying to do and, and then recruiting the heck out of them. And, and the only way you're going to get some of the, the better players is if you go out on Saturdays and you win. So you've got to, yep. you've got to find ways to win and then you got to find ways to continue to elevate your talent. And then something that we didn't do this year, which I think could always be an option in today's world of college football is the transfer portal, right? If you have some consistency at, at coordinator and, and you have some ability to show that, there's a quarterback that can come in and, and have a chance to go play at the next level because of the consistency and, and the staff. And then you got a chance to, you know, to upgrade that level of talent through the portal if that's the way you want to go. Yeah. So recruiting has obviously changed so much over the last even five years that it's basically like you've gone from taking maybe one to two transfers a year at most to taking, you know, possibly 30 to 50 percent of your recruiting class is transfer portal guys if you look at a team like colorado this year i think they brought in like 60 some transfers so what are your general thoughts on you know the, the portal and nil and if it's kind of how it would have impacted your time at Rutgers if you can kind of put yourself in in today's day and age yeah i mean i probably at some point would have been put on the bench <laughs> um yeah you know, there, yep. there wasn't a lot of depth in that room when i played so, you know, fortunately for me, from a playing standpoint, um, you know, I had some, you know, a longer leash or some more opportunities to stay on the field than I might have necessarily had otherwise. 
Um, on the flip side, I didn't make any money playing. You know, I, I got, got the scholarship and got school paid for and stuff like that. Um, but there was a whole opportunity to, to, you know, make money through NIL as a player. Um, it, listen, it's, it's just the way it is nowadays. That that's, that's what college football is. So whether you like it or you don't like it, too bad because it's the reality yep. of it. And you need to, as, as a program, get behind it as a fan base, get behind it. And, and if, you know, you, you don't get behind it, then you have no right to complain on Saturday if we don't win, you know, everyone. And, and I, listen, I love the fans that, that Rutgers has, they're diehard fans and they're loyal, but a lot of times they're full of BS. You know, if you want your team to win, you got to get behind the program and that's what it takes. Uh, you know, people will probably get, get mad that I just said that, but that's the reality of it. And now in today's world, you have to support it, whether you like it or not, it's there and that's how it's going to be. And these other places are getting the support and they're going to continue to pull ahead if we don't support. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I don't, I don't think there's a secret there. I, I know a study came out yesterday. I think Rutgers was last in like, uh, not endowment, <clears throat> but donors over the past like 15 years. And it's like, yeah, the well, last out of the power five schools, yeah, that's what it was, donations yeah. to their alma mater in the last decade, I believe. Yeah, uh, yeah. not great. But no, we, we need to figure out a way how to cultivate more people. There's so much donor yeah. fatigue because you go to the same people over and over and over again. <laughs> yeah, there's hundreds of thousands of alumni. And of those numbers, there's got to be more people that, you know, are fans of sports and, and enjoy sports than than what we've been able to target. So, you know, it's not my job. I don't know how you do it, but they got to figure out a way to, to engage more people. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. Um, but speaking of, uh, I guess your, your former job, you, uh, you were Don Bosco's head coach. Can you uh, just talk about the challenges there and what that was kind of like and what, what it was like coaching some of the, the big town of the big North? Um, it's, it's college football with, with less rules, um, up there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like there, there are no rules, like there's no transfer rules. There's, uh, I guess the only transfer rule that they try to like make it sound like is legit is like. If you're a Catholic school or private school, you, you can't go try to get a, a, a public school to transfer in. Um, just they're trying to keep the public and private separate. But if you're if you're in the public in the private world and there's a kid at St. Joe's and there's a kid at Don Bosco, I guarantee you the coach from Burton Catholic's talking to him, you know, because trying to yeah, get him to come yep. over and vice versa. You know, it just goes throughout that that whole league. Um, talking about like the evolution of of college football. The, the high school world in North Jersey, and I'm sure in a lot of parts of the country, is just outrageous because you're competing for a pool of players that have kind of segregated themselves in like sixth, seventh, and eighth grade into these Pop Warner teams and into these high level competitions, seven on seven teams. And, you know, you go to a, a spring practice for a seven on seven team on a Saturday in, in, in April or, or, you know, March you're going to get every big North coach there because they're recruiting these yep. kids to come to high school. Um, you have to fundraise because you have to, you know, call it what it is. You have to be able to, to provide tuition assistance for kids. There's no scholarships. So you have to provide tuition assistance. You have to pay for your travel. You have to pay for, um, you know, your, your operational budget of the program. So a head coach in that level is, is basically, a head coach in college football with all the added responsibilities of what like a DFO would do or what a chief of staff would do. Um, so it's, it's intense. It's a lot. Um, those guys definitely don't get paid enough to do, to do what they have to do, you know, 12 months of the year, but that's again, what football has become and what youth sports has become. It's a business. Um, and, and you've got to recruit to, to stay in the game and try to have uh, talented enough players to go out and play on, on Friday nights or Saturdays in high school. So talk about, I, I know how insane high school recruiting can get at, at the national level, especially, but what's it like recruiting like sixth, seventh, eighth graders to come to your high school? Is that, is that just like the most absurd process you've ever been a part of, or d did you kind of know what to expect given that you went to a school like Bosco? I had no idea what to expect because it wasn't anything like that <laughs> when I was there, <laughs> you know, like yeah. the, the, 
when I was in like seventh and eighth grade, like in eighth grade, a couple of those coaches started showing up at like the Oakland Braves travel game because that's where I played. So a couple mm-hmm. of them started to look like that. Like it was nothing like it is now. Now, you know, you're going into into gyms and watching kids work out. You're you're trying to talk to the handlers and you're getting in with the, you know, the agent and this guy and that guy. And, you know, you're you're trying to make deals with with parents of a seventh or eighth grader about how you're going to get their kid to school to and home from school and it's just crazy um, the bus the bus will it, take them <laughs> yeah exactly like you know they, they want to well, you know they want a, a limo to show up and take them to and from school um, uh, yeah i know of a, i was talking to Savon huggins a few years ago and he lived in jackson and went to st peter's every day which is uh, for, for those of you who know new jersey geography that is not a short distance that is like <laughs> How does that work? Right. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, I, there's to me and part of the, the reason why I'm not there anymore. There's such an enti- a sense of entitlement um, because you're a, a sixth or seventh grade kid that is projected to be, a, you know, a, a four star coming out of high school. It's like, how the heck do you know you're a sixth grader? You know, you might not grow another inch. Um, or, yeah, well, you know, it's, it's it's just it's just what the kind of the world has become and what the business has become. But but there's a sense of entitlement for that sixth, seventh, eighth grader that they're supposed to do this or they're supposed to do that. And then when you get in the high school and you coach them hard, it's like I don't want to get coached hard. I'm going to go to this other school, you know, because yep. they're saying they're not going to coach you hard. And then they get coached hard there, and then they transfer again. <laughs> you know, how many times yeah. do you see these kids transfer two, three, four times? Yeah. Um, makes it really hard for for the the school and the coach to to coach kids and develop kids at the high school level because that's supposed to be where you're learning to deal with adversity and and get coached up and you know have some tough love and all that stuff and you just can't do that anymore it's sad yep yeah uh sticking with coaching i know we asked you this last time would would you ever go back maybe not the high school level college level because i i believe you've had opportunities since you've uh left the profession yeah no i wouldn't there's there's zero <laughs> chance zero chance um you know if coach Shiano called me today and say hey, i want you to be the the quarterback coach the offensive coordinator i said coach listen i really like where i am right now i'll help in any way that i can but no thank you just no no interest um again i, I mentioned it earlier what i do now and, and how i've been able to grow my business it keeps me around football enough um, getting to do the radio on Saturdays uh, for Rutgers is is enough to keep me around it. I like it just as it is. I like my weekends. I like my family. I, I like hanging out with you know friends. So we're gonna keep it just as it is. Fair enough. So talk about the media. That's fair because you at this point know how big of a commitment it is to be a coach at mo- multiple levels. Because you coached at you know you were an OC at Wagner and you were uh, you know a GA at Rutgers. Your high school head coach. That's a that's a twenty four seven job. You get a call in the middle of the night that your kid, you know, needs something or you got arrested or whatever it is. Like, you're always on. You're always recruiting. So it makes sense. Like, if you want to have two lives, your personal life and a professional life, you kind of can't be a coach. <laughs> so. The joke is twenty four seven, three sixty four and a half because you get like Christmas morning off. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's exactly. Just, it's a hard way to make a living, and you know, I respect the heck out of those guys that do it. Yeah, because you got to love it. You got to be 100% passionate about it. And, and if it's just, if it's not for you, it's not for you. And it's uh, nice to for you that you realize that pretty early in your life. So um, you, you kind of talked about the radio and I, I want to talk about the media in general in terms of there's so many more Rutgers faces on TV now and, and on the radio, like, you know, the McCourty brothers, both are like huge stars in uh, sports media now. You obviously have a guy like Sean O'Hara who's been there forever. But even in like the World Cup stuff, you got Alexi Lawless and Carly Lloyd leading the coverage for the World Cup. What is it? Is it something in the water at Rutgers that just really makes uh, our, our our players or former athletes like that much more personable? Like, did you know any? You obviously know the McCourties, but did you have any interaction with Alexi or Sean or, or Carly when you were at school or after you graduated? Yeah, none with Alexi. Um, Sean, through the years, um, more so when I when I got in the NFL, he was a Franklin Lakes guy, and you know I'm, I'm, I was a local guy too, especially during the lockout. Um, Carly and I actually had a, a class together where we were partners um, for a project back in like '06. Oh, so wow. uh, so we spent time together. And this was before she was like you know who she is now, right? But yeah, you know I think it, it shows. When, when you recruit, as, as any coach, you know, in any sport, when you recruit quality people, 
that are great players, um, th they're going to be set up for, for their life after their sport, whenever they finish playing. And, you know, for whatever reason, we've had a lot of alumni get into the, um, into the media, um, type profession and, and they've all done a, a great job at it. But I think, you know, first and foremost, if, if those players don't have great careers because they were great players, they wouldn't have the opportunities that they have. So they've, they've That's all true. had great careers in their respective sports and positions. And then they've been able to translate that and parlay that into opportunities, you know, off the field. And, you know, the McCordy's are a perfect example, you know, Jay first year out of the NFL, he retires and he's working, you know, on good morning football. Like that, it's a premier job in the NFL. Huge, yeah. yeah. I mean, not only from, you know, a compensation standpoint, I bet he's making a ton of money, but you know, <laughs> just to have that opportunity right away. Um, but it also shows you during their career, they did the broadcasting boot camp stuff through the NFL. I'm sure um, Carly did stuff similar, you know, in, in whatever they provided, you know, in women's soccer. So, you know, it's, it's, it's athletes that are forward thinking that understand that their sport's going to come to an end at some point, you know, and, and listen, Dev and Jay, they probably never have to work again because they've made so much money in the NFL, <laughs> yeah, you know, that again. <laughs> <laughs> but they, but they've, you know, been mature about their career and they know that they want to do something when they finish playing and, and that's what they wanted to do. And they set a goal and it's like anything else. You set a goal and you work towards it and then you get an opportunity and you crush it. And that's exactly what they're doing. Awesome. So, so the real reason why we have you here today, it's the question of the day. What is this team going to be this season? What's your prediction for the season? It's a good question. I think that's, that's if a heavy look, sigh. <laughs> because I think it can, go, it can go a couple of ways, you know, you yeah. look at, you look at the schedule early, mm -hmm. um, who knows what's going on out <laughs> in, in Chicago with Northwestern right no now. One. Right. <laughs> so like it almost becomes a must win for us where if we don't win, like yep. people are going to say like, you know, season's done. There's still going to be a good football team that shows up on Labor Day weekend. Like they're not like, you know, rolling over and saying, you know, here, here's a win Rutgers. Um, but if you get through the first couple of weeks, you know, you get into Michigan and that's going to be a challenge. We've played Michigan really tough recently, but if mm -hmm. you come out of Michigan, you got a chance to be what four and one. If you get to four and one, now you play the rest of the schedule 500, you know, or, or even a game below 500 and you're talking about a bowl team. So I think it's realistic that, that you're looking at six or seven wins, depending on, you know, how the beginning of the season goes. Um, if the beginning of the season, you split it and you end up two and two instead of, you know, three and one or, you know, three and two instead of four and one, then then it's a little little more difficult to, to find wins towards the end of the season. But if you can gain some momentum, you get some confidence in some of these young players, you know, I could see a, a seven or eight win season, um, you know, on the high end. But realistically, you have to run the football better. You have to protect the quarterback better. And the quarterback is going to have to make some, some big plays, uh, especially early on, to find ways to win games. Yeah, we've kind of talked about this. If you lose an early season game, it can just kind of like derail your entire season. Like you saw that with, you know, your 2008 season, like Fresno State, they're a good team, but like that was a team that, you know, was seen as like a similarly level playing field team as Rutgers. I think they had Devontae Adams and, and David, Derek Carr at the time. Uh, but, you know, we, you know, we started off one and five that season and that really kind of took things you know, on a turn and obviously you guys turned it around, but, you know, you've seen time and time again, these teams that are even the good teams, like I think Florida state a couple years ago, they were expected to be a really good team. They had one of those opening season, big games. They lost to Notre Dame. They started the season 0 and 4 after a top 10 preseason rank. So it can happen to any team it is just, it can really throw the momentum off for the entire season. If you lose a game, you kind of think you should win. Um, and that's kind of the situation with Northwestern. You're not going to have an easier conference game than Northwestern to start a season. So you, you really have to take advantage of that opportunity. Yeah, and in, in college football, you don't get any warm-up games. There's no preseason game. Yeah. You do you do two inter-squad scrimmages and you try to simulate it as much as possible and the best that you can. But for some of those freshmen that step out there, you know, even if they came in, you know, mid-year, it's going to be the first time there's a band in the stadium and there's fans there and it's, you know, it's just a different environment. So, you know, how, how ready can you get some of the young guys early on that are going to be contributors to, to be ready to go out and win you a game in, in the big 10 conference. And that, that's a tall ask. So, 
Uh, so it's going to be interesting. I think it's extremely important, though, to your point. You get off to a good start and you can build some momentum. On the flip side, if you don't and, and there isn't any momentum, then you start hearing it from everywhere and it makes it really, really hard to dig out of it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah no kidding. No, that's all I got. I mean, if Mike, you got anything else for him? Um, yeah, anything you wanted to plug or talk about, Mike, before we uh, let you go? No, no, I appreciate you guys having me on. It's always fun to to talk Rutgers football. I'm looking forward to, you know, seeing seeing some improvement on the offensive side this year. I think that, you know, we can say it's been pretty bad the last two, three years. So I not think, good. yeah, okay. not good at all. I think we're going to see a, a much, at least a much better coached unit, um, whether that translates to success, you know, we'll have to wait and see. But uh, I think that's what everyone's looking forward to seeing too. Yeah, and I think everything's so binary in football, either won or you lost, but I think there is a lot of gray that we can improve in. Like, if you just cut down the margin of loss significantly, that would be a huge improvement. Like, we might have the same yeah. record as last year, but we lost five games by 30-plus points last year. If we have yeah. two games where you lose that big this year and you're, you know, you're playing a team like, you know, Wisconsin at Camp Randall to a one-score game in the fourth quarter, that's an improvement. It's so, huge. I think we have to be more nuanced in what we look for in improvement other than wins, lo wins and losses, uh, because I, I, I agree that, you know, I think we'll make progress and I think we'll be better coached, but I don't know if that'll be more wins or not this year. Well, make sure you reiterate that, you know, week 12 when, uh, when we're in the, <laughs> in the heat of it, because they, you yeah. know, you're, you're hundred percent yeah. right there. There are, there are a lot of ways. Unfortunately, the way that you're judged is, is whether you win or lose in football. That's how the best quarterbacks are judged. That's the way it goes. Yep. But there's definitely ways to make substantial strides, um, in the development of the program overall, rather than just wins and losses. So hopefully they, they come with wins and losses, but you know, at the same time, as long as you're you're making those strides and, and getting more competitive week in and week out. Will, will you be there week one or? Down in Northwestern? No, uh, or, well, Rutgers. Yeah. Rutgers, yeah. So yeah. I do the radio for the home game. Oh, God, so, geez. I yeah. completely forgot. I'm, I'm, it's too early for me. <laughs> yeah, talking, yeah. I need another I'll, I'll tap your like, shoulder upstairs and uh, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure. we're eating that great brunch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Phenomenal, let me tell you. <laughs> It's one of the better, I'll admit, it is one of the better uh, food, whatever, servings that they have compared to other places. Other places, it's like brutal. Really? This, I haven't been one, on the road at all, so it, I can't don't, compare. Don't do it. It's not worth it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Mike. Well, we really appreciate you coming on and spreading your insight, telling some, some more stories. Uh, but for me and Richie, this has been another edition of the Night Report podcast, signing off.